So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Howard Hughes. Howard is a past president of the Great Britain Philatelic Society, the GBPS. And the presentation uh, we have today on the Maltese Cross is actually based on a large gold medal winning uh, collection. Um, so some really nice items um, in store for us. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Howard to share his screen and begin. Thanks, Matt. Right, I shall, I shall get that shared. Right, thank you very much for coming and I hope that uh, you enjoy this presentation. It's uh, a story of the Maltese Cross uh, in a series of chapters and we'll show you what those are going to be. Oops. What I don't want to do is go down a rabbit hole of one particular area of the Maltese Cross, um, but I will try and give sufficient information on a number of these and where I don't give sufficient information, I'll refer you to where you can find that information if, uh, if, if you're interested in it. So what we're going to look at today is what, what is or was the Maltese Cross, how it was introduced and some uh, issues with its early use, the problems they had with the obliterating ink colour and the necessity to change it, um, from that then some unusual colours that cropped up in its use, some distinctive shapes of Maltese crosses, some unusual purposes for which the Maltese crosses were put, were put. Um, and then the, uh, the lack of satisfaction with it and its replacement and its subsequent late use. So diving straight in, what is the Maltese cross? These are photographs that uh, Mike Jackson's recently found uh, um, in his collection. They are of the only surviving Maltese cross that we know of, and that uh, it was in use at Wankford in Suffolk. You can see its construction is of a brass head attached to a wooden handle. Great Britain, as many of you know, was the first country to put into place the use of postage stamps and postal stationery, and the Maltese cross was the means devised to obliterate these so they couldn't be used a second time. Obviously, the lessons learned in the use of the Maltese cross would have ramifications for the rest of the world. This is its first known use. It's an internal post office document uh, sent from uh, William Bokenham, the superintending president of the inland office, to Lieutenant Colonel Mabley. And basically it says, this is the proposed design. If you like it, the contractor says he can make it to the cost of a shilling each and at the rate of a thousand a week. They obviously uh, were approved because in no time at all, they were sent out. In fact, four weeks later, 2,000 of them were sent out. They were sent out to post offices throughout the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, but they weren't used before the 6th of May, the date at which they were supposed to uh, commence being used to cancel the new postage stamps and postal stationery. The same can't be true of uh, can't be said rather of the postal stationery and the postage stamps. The public could buy them from the 1st of May and in many cases sent them through the post. And uh, this is an example of a, a already sent on the 5th of May 1840. But as you can see, it's not being cancelled by the Maltese Cross. That was the norm before the 6th of May. That probably gave a false impression that uh, postmasters knew what they were doing with the Maltese Cross, but we'll, we'll soon realise that wasn't true. There are a couple of examples known before the 6th of May. This is one of the two, and um, this is the earliest one. Applied to a stampless wrapper, as was the other one. No idea why it's being used on this, uh, maybe by mistake, or maybe the postmaster was trained to practice his use of the ink composition. We then get to the 6th of May, the first day of use, and the Maltese Cross comes into its own. 75% of first day usages are from London, probably more to do with the distribution of the original Maltese, uh, original Penny Blacks and Mulready's rather than the Maltese Crosses, but certainly it's very unusual to find provincial examples. So the example on the right from Siren Sester is on a Penny Black is uh, particularly nice. It wasn't long before the public had the say, in fact, the very next day. This is an example of a, a newspaper cutting from the Morning Post that describes the uh, Maltese cross somewhat harshly as a sprawling red arabesque, and then goes on to say that Mr. Roland Hill has no business to tattoo the majesty of England into the resemblance of the queen of the cannibal islands. That's a little harsh, I think. What's nice about this particular cutting is that it's paired with the letter that you can see at the bottom left. This is 
uh, a letter that's word for word the same as the cutting, apart from the fact it's unfinished. The last seven or eight words aren't there. It's written on the back of an unposted Mulready. And my theory is that the writer of the um, post office cutting wrote to several newspapers and at some point ran out of steam. And this was one that he didn't actually get round to posting. Thankful he didn't burn it. Continuing with early use of the Maltese Cross, um, the first Sunday was a difficult date to find because London simply didn't cancel mail on a Sunday. So if you can imagine three quarters of mail originating in London on the 6th, by the time we got to the 10th, that would probably have fallen, there's probably um, more provincial mail by then. But even so, it's difficult to find examples from the 10th. And this is a particularly nice example from York, albeit with a particularly manic striker of the cross. Soon after the Maltese Cross had been introduced, um, there began some concern that the red ink could be actually removed from the postage stamps. This is uh, one of a number of articles. Uh, this one appeared in the Worcester Chronicle on the 8th of August, which outlines that a master chemist of the town had succeeded in removing the red ink. It goes on to say that the post office authorities were not particularly impressed with this and told him effectively to do one. And uh, he then decided to do the same thing again, only this time with two stamps. One that he put inside the letter to the post office, the other that he actually used to frank the mail. Uh, he posted it in Liverpool and it did actually get through. So I think he made his point. He then uh, obviously released the details to the press. This sort of publicity, I doubt it bothered the post office that much, but it would certainly have concerned Roland Hill, who was responsible for postal reform. If the stamps and Mulready's were shown in any way to be insecure, then he would effectively have been at risk of his whole, his whole postal reform could have been under threat. So he immediately took steps to try and do something about this. So he initiated trials of stamp color and obliterating ink to try and find a more secure combination. Uh, these were known as the rainbow trials. So you can see here a page where there's a number of uh, penny red stamps that have been obliterated in black and different attempts made to remove the black ink to see if we can, if anybody could successfully remove the ink. If they also removed the ink of the stamp, that was good because it showed that the stamp couldn't be reused. You can see from this particular trial that uh, nobody successfully removed it in this particular, on this particular occasion. What does appear apparent from these trials is that the decision to use a black obliterating ink had been taken at quite an early stage because the black ink was very much the dominant color of the trials. The, uh, the stamp colour was being experimented with, though. The black ink was so, so, uh, so much ahead of any other colour of ink that quite early on, Roland Hill decided that he could ask for a trial of black ink in the Tuppany Post Office. And this trial began on the 31st of August, 1840. Only a, a few months after the, the uh, red ink had been introduced, this trial continued for some considerable time, and there may have been different black inks used during that time, but it ultimately proved successful. So that eventually red ink was replaced with black in February 1841. So we have here uh, the other London office, the inland office, where mail um, was going outside of London. Uh, the 9th of February, we've got red ink, the 10th of February, black ink. This process then rolled out through the rest of the country and took a few days to complete. Uh, in the English provinces, it probably started on the 14th of February. The reason we've got two coloured crosses on, on this particular example is that the uh, letter was posted in Loddon, a small village where the Red Baltic Cross was used, went to Norwich, and Norwich applied the Black Cross because they would now have been in receipt of the black ink and realised that that was the appropriate thing to do. Things were a little bit later in Scotland and Ireland. This is an example from Edinburgh, again showing Edinburgh introducing black ink on the 18th of February. And I think it's fair to say that in Scotland and Ireland, the process took several days to complete, beginning around about this time. However, not everywhere was changed. This is uh, Great Haywood still using red ink in 1842. This is simply because um, the postmaster at Great Haywood didn't receive a supply of black ink, didn't receive instructions to change to black. His office was too small, um, under being under rougely as it was, and so consequently he just carried on using the red ink. It's very nice combination, I think. So moving on into colours in general then, 
we have a number of unusual colours of Maltese cross, but to understand these, I think we need to, to understand a little bit about the red ink a little bit more. Red ink wasn't supplied to postmasters. It was, uh, they were sent instructions for making it, basically um, use some printer's ink, some linseed oil and some olive oil, mix them all together and there's your ink. Now, there's some problems with this, obviously. Uh, the ink um, may not be followed, the instructions may not be followed by the postmaster who may not have accurate means of measurement or even the inclination to measure accurately. The natural ingredients we're talking about could vary in composition um, from batch to batch. And finally, it's quite a, a hassle to make the ink. So actually, it, there may be an temptation to source inks from ready-made sources but from others. And I think that this explains a lot of the varieties of ink we get, certainly during the early phases. So we have here a fabulous uh, magenta Maltese cross from the Llan Rust. And I couldn't tell you what color that cross was in 1840, because I do believe that in the intervening years, a number of these crosses have changed in color due to reactions with pollutants in the air, um, heat, light, and other things that may affect the color. Obviously, um, we, the differences between the official composition accurately made and inaccurate made ink or indeed ready bought ink may become exemplified therefore over time. So on that theme we have a, uh, a lovely cover from uh, a local Bristol cover showing the orange vermilion Maltese cross of Bristol. If you can picture the uh, cover on the left the, multi the penny black actually belongs on the reverse. It's, so I've, I've folded it out to show the penny black. So what happened here originally is that the postmaster thought that there's no stamp on here. He wrote a manuscript two to say that it was Tuttons to pay, then spotted the stamp on the reverse, canceled it with the Maltese cross and put another Maltese cross on the front. All great fun. But if I show you the date stamp, I don't show this in my exhibit by the way, but the date stamp on the reverse, this is the same ink as the Maltese cross and yet it's a completely different color. Bristol Maltese crosses are also recorded in brown. And I think what's probably happened here is that the reductants in the polluted air have changed the orangish ink to brown um, over the years, and maybe even quite quickly. And that I suspect with this cover, although I can't be certain, that it was probably happened at the front and the back, but that somebody has applied some peroxide at some point to try and restore the natural colour of the Maltese cross on the front but probably hasn't done the same to the back. And I think this cover in a nutshell exemplifies the, the warning I would give about um, making any accurate interpretation about what colours were in 1840. I think it's best just to enjoy them for whatever they are now and not be too judgmental about them and uh, make sure you get a certificate of authenticity when you buy a particular colour. If we take that theme a little bit further forward again, this is the, the white Maltese cross of Sirencester fairly grubby looking cover, but the White Maltese Cross is, is quite startling. The covers from the same time period that are pristine show a delicate pink Maltese Cross that wasn't mixed in the appropriate uh, mixture, I don't think, but it, it's certainly a different composition and therefore in some climatic conditions seems to have uh, gone into this nice white colour. Not all um, Postmasters follow the official of using red or black ink. One or two of them misbehaved and deliberately used different colours. So this is a blue ink here. It's not a question of something degrading. It's actually a deliberate variance in policy. And this particular culprit is the postmistress of Truro, Joyce Thomas. And she quite correctly used the black composition when it was supplied to her in February 41. And around about April 41, she occasionally experimented with the blue ink probably found that she didn't get told off and increasingly began to use blue ink so that from late in 1841 she was using exclusively blue ink. Um, she did stop though thankfully when she died in August 43. It would be quite worrying if she hadn't. This is a different blue Maltese cross. This is one that's been applied by accident. The postmaster at Settle used blue Maltese cross, blue, blue ink for his date stamp on the reverse accidentally used it for the Maltese cross as well, and then gave two strikes of a red Maltese cross to try and remedy the defect. What he actually did is create a much more beautiful cover, I think. These are very unusual. I know of only two combinations of red and blue Maltese crosses on my cover. 
Green Maltese crosses also cropped up occasionally deliberately, nearly all from Ireland, probably for understandable nationalistic reasons. So here we have Moat again with a, a quite a nice green Maltese cross matching the, the date stamp on the reverse. So leaving colours aside then and, and now moving to the design of the Maltese cross, we talk about some Maltese crosses as being distinctive. What do we mean by this? Well, there's, there's a variety of opinions, but I, I would argue that a distinctive Maltese cross should be one that is recognisable off cover, where you don't actually know where it's been applied, but the shape or something about it tells you where it's been applied. And these can arise by a number of different uh, means. The first that I've chosen to classify are just normal crosses that become distinctive through um, wear and tear, through deliberate means, or possible through uh, inking abnormalities. Second type are those that are manufactured locally, possibly a, a local postmaster wanted an additional, additional obliterator, possibly um, one for one of his sub offices, but didn't feel confident in asking London for them because he thought that they may not approve of that and therefore had them manufactured locally. And finally, we have the um, manufactured in London crosses where we have a deliberate variation in design that comes from London. And we'll look at these three in turn. So normal crosses that became distinctive. These are all perfectly normal Maltese crosses, but as you can see, have been scored, marked, or worn in a manner that's left some defect in the cross. They're becoming progressively less distinctive as we go from left to right, but probably all these are distinctive and they, they belong to uh, towns of Watton under Edge, Malinga, London, and then Kendall. Of a slightly different nature, we have solid centered crosses, hollow crosses, and double lined crosses. Now, these are probably less distinctive in that they can belong to more than one town. So the solid centered crosses, I can think of probably a dozen towns that, that had them. Um, on, on an off and off basis, they were down to either debris collecting in the middle of the Maltese cross, or in some cases, a bubble forming there, which gave this, this lovely effect. The middle hollow centered was traditionally attributed to wear, but I'm convinced by Mike Jackson's argument that you can actually get this effect by striking the Maltese cross in a particular manner. And it may have been a particular fastidious clerk that managed to get this effect. He's particularly persuasive as well in that this heavy brass isn't likely to wear to this extent. And the double line crosses, um, startling examples come from Stonehaven, but there are a number of other towns where you get this doubling effect of the ink. The, it's almost certainly down to the way the ink was mixed at Stone Neighbor and certainly in other towns as well. And I think that the clearest indication of that is that the doubling effect disappears overnight when we go from black to red ink. Just a couple of examples of these then. So this is Mullinga, the one that we showed you with the, um, the notches in it. Um, and you can see a nice example of that here, particularly nice because part of it's struck on paper as well, which always exemplifies the defects. The what an under edge, the, this one, uh, again, I think it had to be deliberately scored. I suppose it's, it's just feasible. It might've been left on some really hot grid, but the, the way it's the, the scoring isn't symmetrical, I think implies it's being filed um, for some local reason to make the cross slightly more distinctive. Moving on then to crosses that were manufactured locally. We know of only one manufacturer and that's Alexander Kirkwood and Son, who did a number, prepared a number of Scottish crosses. And we'll talk about some of those in a sec. There are a group of very similar Irish crosses that must have had one manufacturer. And we can look at some of those. We don't know who the manufacturer is. Norwich and Plymouth are so similar that they must have had the same manufacturer, but we don't know who that is. And then there's a, a whole stream of other Maltese crosses that don't appear to have any relation to each other in terms of shape or size and probably had different local manufacturers and we'll look at just a few of those. So Kirkwood and Sons, this, we could do a talk on Kirkwood and Sons in its own right, but basically these are the Maltese crosses they made, probably um, four or five for Edinburgh. The Edinburgh ones are not listed in their proof books, but all the other ones are. They're also also listed in their order books. The cost of these crosses to the post office was three and six each, whereas the cost of buying them from London was a shilling. 
I don't know what was going on with that. It sounds very suspicious to me. Example of the bigger cross. Um, this is one of the, uh, well, it is the rarest one of them. Uh, there's only uh, four examples on cover known. And it's a, it's a lovely shaped square cross with a small sensor. Another very rare one is Alexandria. Uh, again, half a dozen or so of these known. Uh, always struck in this wonderful brown ink as well. So it's, it's doubly distinctive because of the ink as well as the shape of the cross. Moving on to the Irish type crosses, we can see here, these were the designs that were introduced in Ireland that I, I, I believe, and of course many others believe, had one manufacturer. They are all different and can be distinguished from each other upon study. Again, I'm not going to go through that today. I'll just show you this example of the Ross cross, which I think is a, a wonderful example. Part with when you've got one that isn't on the stamp at all, it really exemplifies the, the beautiful nature of this cross. Uh, Norwich and Plymouth, again, these are the two crosses. You can see the Plymouth looks a little bit more elongated than the Norwich. The Norwich looks a bit squatter. You can do measurements to distinguish the two, uh, although for years it was thought that they weren't distinguishable. Just a quick example of a Norwich cross. This cover is actually far more interesting for the fact that the, the, um, it's been readdressed a couple of times and it, the final address is on the reverse, which caused some confusion at the post office. And we'll just quickly then look at these other distinctive Maltese crosses. Um, I'm going to do them one at a time, so we don't need to look at them from this screen. Coventry uh, usually shows up very well, a nice small centre, and then the middle cross, very thin ends to the arms. It's very unusual in this uh, nature, this cross. And then the outer cross has got little, just, just quite small indentations for the coves in the corners. Very attractive cross and shows up very nicely on a Tupney blue. The York Cross, similarly, the, the, a number of different features about this cross, but the, the middle cross in particular, with its flat end plates and square looking design is, a, is quite a feature. The Manchester Maltese Cross, only in use for a few months, but there's, there's still quite a few of them around. Uh, unusual on the outside, and they have these V, v shaped instead of curves in the coves. And within the middle cross, there's a couple of double points rather than single points, which was unique to Manchester. And that's why it gets the name, the, uh, the fishtail Maltese cross, because they resemble fishtail. This is a startling cross, the Kilmarnock cross. Um, a lovely strike of it here. There's, there's virtually no way that this resembles any other cross I've ever seen in either the middle inner or outer elements. And of course, it's got an additional dot in the middle as well. Uh, only in use for a few months from January 44 onwards. Another uh, amazing cross is the Whitehaven Maltese cross, which is a, a big cross. You can see a very square middle part of the design. Um, the eagle eyed of you will notice that this is on a penny star rather than a, a penny in Perth. It had an interesting history, the Whitehaven Maltese cross, only in use for maybe a few months uh, when it was introduced at Whitehaven, then replaced by an ordinary Maltese cross in mid-1841, but then crops up in 1856 for, for at least about 10 years after that in the nearby market town of Egremont. And then even more balmy, the hand-drawn Maltese cross of Dunnard. There's four of these now, and this is the probably uh, the most carelessly drawn one of them, although it's probably the nicest cover. Uh, I think in 1842, the postmaster must have lost his Maltese cross and started trying to draw one and got progressively less diligent in that. And this being the, the, the least diligent of the lot. And then we look at the Maltese crosses made in London. I'm being a little bit mischievous here, but I'll, I'll come on to that in a second. These are crosses that I regard as being official variations in design. The ones we've looked at to date Although the, post, the, the individual manufacturer may or may not have attempted to put their particular signature on the Maltese cross, they were certainly not authorised from London. But these came from London and were definitely deliberate. Within the Inland Office, uh, the Inland Office is the office that dealt with mail going out of London, if you remember, they commissioned a number of 12, 12 numbered crosses. These are all different. Uh, just. Uh, um, I remember a conversation with David Rockoff. David used to uh, make the templates for the encyclopedia books. 
And to make these templates of a Maltese cross, he would have a, a large touch screen. He would blow up the side of the Maltese cross so it was quite large. And then using a handheld pen, erase all the stamp and the background to the Maltese cross, and then fill in the bits that were missing with black to present these templates. He says that he got it down, I think, by the end to about 40 minutes to do it, but it's still quite an investment in time. And I remember him saying to me when he was doing this chapter on London, we don't need to do all 12, do we, Howard? And my answer, which thankfully was very much supported by Mike Jackson was, yes, you do, because they're all different. And if you take the number out of them, they will, you can still recognize any of these Maltese crosses because of that. The purpose of them still remains unclear. We, we think it's probably to identify a desk in the inland office, but uh, there are lots of other theories around. You'll notice that the, the number three has no small cross on top. And this also entered service several days before the others. And I think this was probably as a prototype, probably the lessons learned from that use meant that the cross was added to the others. And this would have enabled the postmaster to know which way up the design was, uh, further, uh, further enable them to distinguish between the number six and nine, uh, but also giving them a more elegant appearance. It's also of course made them slightly bigger, which may have been, may have been useful as well. They uh, were entered service in three tranches with the last group, seven to 12, starting on the 1st of April, 43, with number three having previously been in use from the 16th of March. And we'll kind of look at those now. This is the, the 16th of March, 1843, the first day of use of the, the number three in cross. As you can see, there's no evidence of a, a small cross on top of there. I have read occasionally in the past that people thought the cross had dropped off, but I think it, it's clear it was just never there. And then the first day of use of the number 18 cross on, a, on another nice uh, already, again on the 1st of April, 1843. And this is where I'm being a little bit mischievous in including the um, previously known as the Channel Islands Maltese Cross, but I'm calling the London Ship Letter Office Maltese Cross in this presentation, at least. I wouldn't be that brave. It was a Channel Islands Specialist Society. Um, this cross, to my eye, has some superficial resemblance to the numbered crosses in that it's large and delicate in design. I believe it was produced in London, and I believe it was produced deliberately for the London Ship Letter Office. The the rationale for that it was used there is simply that the um, two main offices in the Channel Islands who cancel mail, Jersey and Guernsey, both had their own Maltese crosses. All the mail that originated from the Channel Islands that bears this Maltese cross went through Southampton and then the London Ship Letter Office. And the, the absolute clincher for me is that two covers didn't come from the Channel Islands at all, they came from the continent went through the London Ship Letter Office and have strikes of this cross on them. So that's the only common point which they all went through. If you accept that the cross was applied at the Ship Letter Office, then you'd probably say it was deliberately manufactured. And that's where I've got to where I have with my theory on this. It's a very nice Maltese cross anyway. So moving away from distinctive crosses, we now look at uh, unusual usages of the Maltese cross. Um, now the, the instructions that went out with the Maltese cross were quite clear. And I'll, I'll explain them to you, or I'll read them to you. You will carefully stamp with the cancelling stamp that has been forwarded to you, the stamped covers and envelopes, as well as the adhesive stamps. The two former must be struck on the figure of Britannia. And in the case of more than one adhesive stamp being attached to a letter, each stamp must be separately obliterated. So those were clear instructions to postmasters. With them already, obliterate Britannia with a stamp, carefully obliterate each stamp. So it can be said that this usage on this page are contrary to instructions, at least. I particularly like the one on the left because the, the words of the notice I've just read to you were the notice in Scotland that was signed by Sir Edward Lees. And this cover is actually addressed to Sir Edward Lees and uh, hasn't been cancelled. I, I love the thought of him holding his head in, head in his hands and weeping as he, as he sees it. Uh, the one on the right is from Bradford and Wiltshire. And there you see a single Maltese cross um, expeditiously cancelling a pair, but probably uh, not in accordance with instructions. It's arguable whether the cover at the top left is, is not in accordance with the same instructions. You will carefully stamp. Well, I think that's a little bit more than carefully stamping. stamping. I think that's something a bit unhinged. So I think I would say that that probably is contrary to instructions. It's certainly um, not going to be used again, that stamp. 
Bottom right is, is uh, another interesting habit. This, this time we have the um, postmaster at Spilsby. He was called Edward Banks. And he adi additionally struck most of his covers with this uh, additional Maltese cross you see in the middle there. So he canceled the stamp and then canceled the cover as well. And um, we don't know why he did it, um, but again, he stopped this when he died in May 1842. So you can have covers after there that don't bear this double strike. It's very nice to be able to have the two together. These are unnecessary strikes simply because Mulready caricatures, which these are, are basically um, printed envelopes or wrappers that took the mickey out of the Mulready design. They weren't valid for paying postage, so there was no point cancelling them. The one on the left has been cancelled, but you'll notice there is a manuscript two at the bottom indicating that postage hasn't been paid and there's a further tuppence to pay. And the example on the right, uh, the postage has been paid by the Penny Black, which has been cancelled, but an additional strike unnecessarily applied to the cover itself. And some more fun usage of the Maltese cross. Uh, the one, the cover on the left from Darlington, the uh, uh, perhaps somewhat fussy postmaster, having discovered that he's applied the number two upside down, has cancelled it with the Maltese cross and then applied the correct number two up the right way up above it. Uh, the one on the right is a little bit more interesting. This is from Dune in Scotland where the postmaster appears to be in the habit of applying the handstruck one to indicate that postage had been prepaid, but then cancelling the handstruck one with the Maltese cross. He's done this on at least three occasions and I've not seen a cover that it hasn't been done. So I think this was routine practice there, certainly for a period of time. And so it was that the Maltese cross um, was deemed to be unsatisfactory. There were a number of reasons for this. It was too small. Um, it didn't identify the office of use and it was hollow in the center, which sometimes meant, particularly on black stamps, that are sometimes it's only blues, it couldn't be seen that easily. And so we have here an announcement in the Times of the 10th of May saying that wonderful new obliterators have come into play. And they say that at the very bottom that they have the advantage of appearing much more business-like than the confused mode of obliteration originally adopted. Again, another harsh comment. I think it was very badly done to the Maltese cross. But it was replaced. So here are the, um, the replacements in, in, uh, in action. In the English provinces and Wales, the 1st of May, 1844, numerals were introduced. And we have here a first day cover from Liverpool with above it, the last day of use of the Maltese cross. It took a while before the rest of the country followed, but on the 17th of May, the inland office did actually replace its numerals, its Maltese cross with a numeral. So you can hear, see here the number three in cross on its last day of use and the first day of use of a numeral. The first day of use numerals are particularly rare. I only know of four of them. Really difficult to get hold of those. Oh, sorry on that as well. The, uh, I'm not bothered to show this, but the, the other office in London, the London District Post uh, that dealt with local London Mail, that replaced its Maltese cross, not on the same day, but a few days later on the 21st of May. Scotland and Ireland were even later still, they were in June. So uh, this is uh, the earliest known numeral from either of those, and it's Glasgow from the 19th of June. This is a first day of use Glasgow numeral. I do have a cover from the 18th of June, uh, 1844, showing the Maltese cross in use on that day, but it's such a horrible cover, I couldn't bring myself to show it to you. Um, so, so Glasgow was the first Scottish office to change over probably. 10 days later, Edinburgh did the same, and most of the other officers were somewhere in between those two dates. Very similar dates for Ireland. So the Maltese cross has been replaced and we can all breathe a sigh of relief and that's the end of the talk, but alas not, no, uh, because it carried on in some places. We have here uh, an example from plate 92, which wasn't even registered until 1849 with uh, two complete rows of stamps obliterated by the Maltese cross five years after it should have been replaced. In fact, this is um, not as unusual as it might seem, although obviously two, two complete rows are unusual. It's probably 50 villages that carried on using the Maltese cross after 1844, simply because they were villages, they were not sub-officers, they were not entitled to numeral obliterators, and for some reason they'd already got hold of a Maltese cross, so they simply carried on using it. We find that this, this usage, as you get through 1845 and 1846, it falls off. 
Um, and by the time you get to the introduction of perforated stamps in 1854, you're down to maybe 10 or a dozen offices or villages that still had a Maltese cross in use. And that fell off very dramatically after that as well. Again, this is a, um, a subject dear to my heart that I could have given a, a separate display on. I'm choosing not to talk too much about it tonight. We'll simply uh, finish off with a couple of um, late examples. This one is the latest known use of the Maltese cross that I've ever seen. 1887 in the Edinburgh Money Order Office. So that's a, a trifling uh, 43 years after it should have been replaced. Heaven knows where they found the Maltese cross to do this. What's happened here is that the uh, clerk has date stamped a number of money orders um, to save time during the day, then got to the end of the day with some left. And so the next day has obliterated the 23rd of December and restamped it the 24th. There's a, a kiss imprint on the back of uh, this happening on another money order from the same office that doesn't match this particular one. So there was obviously more than one example that was done on this date. And then finally, from the, from the stamps, we have this um, outrageous cover. Um, it's addressed to the Queen, and it's a Maltese cross from 1854, 10 years after it should have been replaced on a perforated penny star. Um, it's come from uh, Maltby in Yorkshire, near Rotherham, and the address reads, For Her Majesty the Queen of England, Windsor Castle, Berkshire, or elsewhere, all speed, or death. So it's and a lovely little... Um, curse mark around the word death as well. So showing that there's a, um, a gypsy type curse and anybody uh, delaying the mail. Uh, I'm not sure whether this ever found its way safely into the hands of uh, Queen Victoria, but it was certainly opened twice in transit and resealed. I think that people might have been somewhat concerned about the contents. So if you've been interested in, in the Maltese Cross as a subject and wants to know some more about it, I've alluded to Mike Jackson and David Rakoff a couple of times. They've produced an excellent series of encyclopedia, three of them, that uh, go through much of this in a great deal of uh, detail and tell a, a really good story. Uh, much more concise than that, you have the um, Stanley Gibbons part one catalog, volume one catalog, uh, shortly to be uh, released as volume 1A, which is just line engraved. And that gives you a lot of the prices and illustrations of the distinctive crosses in there. Uh, a, less, a lesser known work, quite recent work actually by Johnny Rea in Germany, um, produced by the FGGB, our, our sister society in Germany, uh, is very involved in the measurements of Maltese crosses and how you can distinguish one from another by accurate measurements. And uh, it's, it's well worth a read. I think that there's, a, there's more mileage in, in um, the updates to this book and more can be learned from this methodology in the future. Or, or failing that, there's the good old fashioned Maltese cross cancellations for the United Kingdom uh, by uh, Alcock and Holland. And that's uh, um, a, a very good basic grounding in the book. So I'm happy to answer questions uh, in a minute. If you want to uh, correspond with me on some aspects of this or something that you want to talk further, there's my email address there. You don't have to remember it because it is on the GBPS website. I am, a, um, I am down there as, as one of the um, consultants, so that can be uh, accessed through the website. And finally, just a quick uh, advertisement there for the GBPS. Um, that's a picture of the website bottom right. We produce a, a newsletter in a journal six times a year, and it's ridiculously cheap. You'd be mad not to join. Thank you. Brilliant, Howard. Thank you so much. That was so comprehensive. Um, absolutely fascinating. So we've got oh, quite a few questions. Um, from I, I just had a question. How did you? How did your interest in the Maltese Cross kind of develop? Because obviously it's gone quite far. Yeah, it's, it's um, originally a stamp collector, then I became interested in the postmarks on the stamps, then I realised mm -hmm. that the postmarks were probably better on a cover, and then uh, I realised that actually I couldn't afford to do much more than just Maltese Cross because uh, I was becoming more interested in that area, so it became more and more specialised with time. Yeah. Do you think there's, because um, that I mean that was that felt so comprehensive, and I know you mentioned a few times we could do a talk on this particular aspect of it or this, um, mm -hmm. are there a lot of examples you're still looking for? Um, probably not. Not because okay, I, I, I'm probably not, not that it's complete. It's just that it, um, mm. I'm probably looking more now to um, to record than actually own things, if you like. But there's, there's yeah. plenty of areas for research still. Excellent. 
Okay, well, let's let's go on with the questions. Um, so, Peter Cockburn asked, why was the Maltese cross chosen to make the first obliterator? So I think why, why that design? Um, Does anyone know? It was nothing to do with postal reform. It was an internal post office uh, matter. And we have to understand that there's a fair bit of dissatisfaction within the post office um, about postal reform. They didn't like cheap posties. They didn't like the amount of extra work for less income. So mm. the postal reform, which was a political um, imposition for the post office, um, caused a bit of friction. They were, however, left with the decision on how to cancel stamps to stop them being reused a second time. I doubt that they put a great deal of thought into it, if I'm honest, and they produced the Maltese Cross, uh, and it's probably a, um, the manufacturer who designed it. Yeah, okay. And do we know who actually who actually came up with that design? Is there a um, we probably know who the manufacturer person. Um, not the design, though, because all we know is that letter that I show, the internal uh, mm. letter, is just about the only thing that I've found in the archives at all. Um, in fact, and that's in the Phillips bequest, it's not really part of the main post office um, archives. Um, the, the company that manufactured the Maltese Cross is probably Samson Morden and Co. They, they made the first propelling pencil. They were really famous um, manufacturers of objet d'art and do a very, very uh, fine uh, workmanship came from them. They certainly made it in 1842. There's a price list in 1842 in the archives saying that if you want any more of these, you get them from Samson Morden and Co. Right, okay. Okay. Um, okay, so this is um, really uh, a good one and something I've often thought is, why did they not incorporate a date in the design? Um, Roland Hill originally suggested that you use a double date stamp. Um, and that, that's where we come back to the conflict between Roland Hill and the politicians and the post office. I think it's, it would be eminently more sensible to have used um, a, a double date stamp that would actually have identified the town and given the portion of the date stamp on the cover. I don't think the post office really wanted to play. Right, okay. It was their decision. No, it wasn't anything to do with Roland Hill. It was a post office decision and I don't think they cared that much. But yes, no, okay. far more sensible to have a, uh, something like a duplex type of cancel or a double date stamp. Yeah, which they, I mean, they eventually realised that, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, they put, put off the inevitable. Okay, and were the hand stamps made of wood or metal? Um, well, the picture showed at the beginning showed that it was a brass. That's, mm. uh, that's the only remaining one, but it was a brass uh, head that was probably manufactured from moulds, probably a number of moulds to produce the heads, because um, make, they're they making them a thousand a week, so they were churning them out. Um, wow. the, the brass head was attached to a metal pin, which, which was driven into the wood under pressure and then became lodged there. So wooden handle, brass head. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, we've got one more, a um, few more actually. Uh, from Colin Clark, are Invereri and Tynemouth Maltese crosses considered variants or mainstream out of London supply of, of, of literators? I'll put my teeth back in. Here the second town then, Invereri and... Tynemouth. Oh, Tam, no, I think I think they were both common crosses. I'm not aware of any local manufacturer of those at all. So okay. the, the initial um, manufacture of, of generic normal crosses were 2,000. They didn't distribute 2,000 in one go. There were still some left in London. So it, you, you really, it's unusual, in spite of the fact that if you, if you read catalogues, you think that Maltese crosses are, of a, a distinctive nature are quite common. They're not in, in the general scheme of things. Most crosses were normal crosses. Right, okay. Okay. Um, and finally, we've just had one from, oh no, we've got some more coming in actually. Uh, Jack Zhang asks, are all these collections yours, Howard? Hi, Jack. Um, yeah, there was, in, that, in this particular display, they were all mine, yes. Okay. Um, and Chris Platt asks, how do we know the Maltese cross is the only one left? Were they all deliberately destroyed? Uh, that's a good question, that Chris. Um, probably, it, well, it's, we know it's the only one left because it's the only one we know of. It's not, it's not mm. deliberately the only one that's been retained for posterity. It just turned up in the 1970s in, a, in um, I think it was an attic or something above the old post office, and it was a find, and that's how, that's how it's, it's been preserved, researched and then preserved after that. It's even been x-rayed to show how it was put together. So no, no other Maltese crosses come to light. 
that's how we know it's the only one but it, it doesn't mean it's the only one it, but given that we've had 50 years since 1970 and another one hasn't mm. in that time it seems less and less likely we'll find another yeah yeah so i guess at, at the point where it was replaced you know it wasn't considered anything particularly significant so they just um, got on with the next one I don't think they were recalled at all because we can see um, a number of them cropping up after 1844 occasionally as an instructional mark which meant that it was still in the post office it just wasn't being used mm, okay okay brilliant well that's that's the end of the questions i'm just um thinking you said you're not particularly looking for anything else to add to your own collection more recording different examples do you think there's a long way to go before everything's you know, recorded and we, we have examples of everything, every use, or is that just an ongoing, never ending? Yeah, I think there's quest. some where, particularly with dates of usage, that, that there's some mileage still in, in finding things out. Um, there's some, I, I only found um, Alexander Kirkwood and Co's order books uh, going back maybe seven or eight years ago. So they'd been hidden in that time. Right. That's where we found out the price. That it's three and six, and and, and their lists. Um, I think the doc. I think the way the archives are organised. Uh, I don't mean that in a disparaging sense, but I think that things may come to light in the future that will cast light on areas that we're not previously aware of, simply because of the filing system. Um, so yeah, I think there'll be plenty of things to find out in the future, plenty of areas for research. Um, but I, we'll never have a complete complete story. I don't think. No. No. Okay, and just finally, if someone wanted to start a collection, is it relatively cheap? You know, it, is there other examples you can get quite cheaply to begin with? The it's funny when I when I was putting together my exhibit, I'm, I'm going back a long, long time now because I'm because I'm old. Um, the the difficult things I found were the the dates. So I. First of all, they weren't in, at that stage. They weren't um, in any literature at all. Nobody knew when some of the dates uh, where certain of these transitions I've talked about today happens. So I've had to actually find the information out myself through through research and creating databases. Well, that's cheap because the crosses are often not distinctive or expensive. These mm. just people, nobody else realizes the value in them. Yeah. Uh, so that element research is often cheap, and it gives you an, um, an advantage in finding things over the years afterwards. But I'm afraid once my exhibit reached the stage where the, the judges wanted to see um, uh, distinctive crosses in, that's when it starts to become expensive, I'm afraid, and yeah. crosses as well. So I think you can put together a really good collection and tell the story of the Maltese cross without spending a lot of money. Yeah. Exhibiting. Yes. Yeah. Which I guess you could say for a lot of different yes, yeah. uh, types of philately, couldn't you? Yeah. Okay. Well, Howard, that's brilliant. Thanks so much for your time um as you as you said in the presentation your email was on there um just to let everyone know we're also recording this session um so we'll put it onto the allaboutstamps.co.uk website um so you can watch it again uh, in case you missed anything and tell your colleagues to come along and watch it um just finally a little plug um from me uh we do have some special offers um to coincide with the conference today tomorrow and on saturday so one of those is to subscribe to Stamp Collector Magazine for 3p. So um, that, that is literally outrageous. A it's outrageous, yeah. So we um, we introduced that that um, offer at the very start of the lockdown back in March. Um, you get three issues for 3p um, and then you go on to a direct debit. So it's a really good way of trying the magazine. And uh, we've brought that back for the conference. Um, so do have a look on the website and then you, know, you don't have to worry about the shops, whether they're open or not, whether you should be going out will deliver the magazine to your home. So that's the end of my uh, plug. So again, thank you, Howard, so much for your time. Um, you. Really fascinating presentation. Thanks everyone for coming along. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone, bye.